Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Rosenthal. I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about a naturalist, which is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start the PowerPoint. Looks like everybody's muted themselves, so fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And let's get started. All right. So I always like to start uh, whenever I do programs on iNaturalist and the City Nature Challenge, I always like to start with something um, new that I found and learned uh, as a result of, of using iNaturalist. And this little critter was one of my, my newer exciting finds um, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, rolling over one of the logs uh, next to the pond uh, at Gulf Branch. This is a, what I learned was this is a blue garden flatworm which is really neat because it's something I've never seen before. I also learned that it is introduced in the United States, which I wasn't surprised about because it was definitely looking like something I'm, I'm not used to seeing around here. Uh, what was interesting is it's, excuse me, uh, native to Australia and New Zealand, uh, although you can see it's been found in many other, other places, which probably means it's coming in on, um, you know, in soil of potted plants, things like that. Uh, it likes moist areas. Um, and obviously it will shelter under rocks, rotting logs, and leaf layers. Pretty neat. Uh, and it is a planarian. It's a flatworm that is a hunter of invertebrates such as wood, li wood lice or wood louses, depending on how you like to say that, uh, millipedes and earwigs uh, and land snails. Um, so it's pretty neat to find that. I'm not happy that it's an introduced species, but it was pretty neat to, to find something new and, and to be able to figure that out using iNaturalist. So this is what we came to talk about tonight. This is iNaturalist. It's iNaturalist.org. Um, it is something I've been doing for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Um, and I absolutely uh, enjoy it, adore it, always try to get other people to do it. Hope that people are doing it because I think it, it, it um, contributes to um, a greater knowledge of everything that's going on around us. Uh, and, and I hope that, that people can do it because what I always like to remind people is you can be a researcher or scientist in the lab. Uh, and at some point you're going to have to be in the lab or you're going to have to not be in the field. When you have something like this where there are thousands of people making observations all around the world that are out in the field just wandering doing their thing and they see something they think hey that's interesting that could be the piece that you need to understand a range expansion uh, a change in migration patterns a change in uh blooming patterns all these different things um and so all these little pieces can contribute to something that's much much bigger um so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into uh how to use iNaturalist uh, and I'll talk about the uh, City Nature Challenge, which is coming up uh, about eight days from now, I think. Yeah, it was, today's the 20th, um, less than less than nine days. It's uh, the first day is uh, April 29th. It starts at, uh, of course, at 12.01. I am on uh, on April 29th. So um, let's jump in here. Um, I'm going to start by showing you uh, the website and step by step of how to do it from the um, from taking a, a digital photo. So you get a digital photo on your camera, you take the file, you move it on your computer, or you move it directly in iNaturalist from your camera. So I'm gonna start with that. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show you some other little things about uh, using it on, uh, I have an iPhone, so those are the screen grabs I have, but it's probably very similar to what's on an Android. Uh, and then we'll look at a few other things as well. Um, so let's say you find something really neat. You might know what it is, or you might not know what it is, but you can always put it up on iNaturalist to either, uh, make sure you're correct. Find out what it is because you're not sure. Um, but then you can also post it, and it's a way of saying, "Hey, this is a critter that we're finding here in this park or here in this region." Uh, so it's a northern ringneck snake. Uh, and this is something I posted on iNaturalist. Um, you can see there's a lot of information going here. It's really easy. It's not nearly as intense as it might look, especially if you're seeing this for the first time. But it's really easy to. Um, add all of this information and essentially provide a, a nice piece of data for a researcher who may want to use that. Um, there are also things on iNaturalist called projects where you can put in or request. Um, you can either do something that automatically populates, so you can do like uh, this third one here, global global reptile bio blitz. Essentially, they just want to see a list of all the reptiles that are being reported around the world on iNaturalist. So if you enter something. Uh, if you enter an observation and it is a reptile, boink, it's going to go into there automatically. Just like if you enter something like the snake, which happened to be in the nature center, literally in the basement, um, it's in our park. 
anything within that geographic area bink, automatically goes into biodiversity in Gulf Branch and Glebe Road Park. Some projects you have to enter manually, like Never Home Alone. I entered it in this because again, the snake was found in our basement. Uh, but like uh, the second one here, Virginia Bio Blitz, and the first one, Arlington Fauna, both are an all inclusive of uh, Arlington Fauna. So any uh, critters found in Arlington. And then uh, Virginia Bio Blitz is everything that's been reported in Virginia automatically goes in there. So um, some really neat projects that uh, you can contribute to. And you don't, and like I said, the only one I actually had to add was actually these last two, but I don't do this last one anymore because there's the Virginia Bio Blitz. But Never Home Alone is one I like to add to. I think it's a really neat project and I like to look to see what people are finding in their homes around the world. Um, so that's, it's a fun one that to, to join and see what's, what's going in there. And so I, I make the effort to, uh, add that one whenever I have something that goes in there. Uh, but generally, these first four, these were all auto populated, they automatically went in. I didn't have to do any work. So it's really neat that just by contributing this one observation, I've contributed to these top four projects as well. Uh, and then here's the neat thing when you submit something to iNaturalist, I always tell people it's kind of like Facebook for people that like nature. OK, so there's no political commentary. There's no here's what I had for dinner or dessert. Um, there's no if you're really my friend, you'll follow this and like this and repost this and mention my name. It's just posting a picture or posting a sound uh, and getting other people to to view it and hopefully agree with it or help you identify it or get it there. Um, and what you're what one of the goals is to get it to uh, the quality grade, which is research. Research is is fairly simple to get to. It's two thirds of your um the identifications on your observation agree okay so i had a said it was a ring neck snake one other person said it was a ring neck snake boom two out of two is 100 percent. so it goes to research grade it's not going to be research grade with only one there's got to be at least one more observation okay if you have four uh, uh, four identifications but they're you know all four are different or two or one and two or the other uh it's going to stay as needs id it's not going to be the research grade yet you can also see there's the, the word casual up here casual is usually reserved for things that um can't get an identification sometimes but oftentimes casual is a is is um, most of the time when i see it it's there's no evidence someone's like hey i saw uh i saw a mountain lion today I don't have a picture, I don't have a sound, but I want to still put it on iNaturalist and list it in my profile as something I saw. Um, so you can do that. It just won't get to uh, up here in the upper left here, that green ribbon that says research grade. Um, I'm not going to go over all the research grade qualifications here, but obviously you can see um, it looks like this is a, a pretty extensive of the list. It's a good list, but it's really easy to fill this out. Date specified, location specified, all these things. I'm going to go over that more later. I do want to point out here organism is wild. You can put up um, critters that you see in a zoo or that are pets. You can put up um, plants that are in a garden, but you really should indicate that they are captive or cultivated. Uh, and then I don't know if it's going to be research grade if it says that, but this is um, but it probably would just check the thumbs down. It'd be my guess. I don't list those. Uh, it's not my interest or what I'm into. So um, I actually don't know what it would look like if it was there. But and then down here, evidence of organism. That's your picture. That's your sound recording, whichever the case may be. Um, once you get to research grade, now it can be featured on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility site. Uh, and that's really, really neat. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I think don't think it's my next slide. I think it's a little further into the, the thing, but um, this is really neat that it goes in there because this is where it becomes usable by researchers who, are, who may or may not be looking for information or data that, um, you know, could take years to collect, but if you've got a bunch of people out there already doing it, you can get that data much, much more easier and so Oh, good, it is my next slide. Um, so you can see here, this is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I think I actually snagged this. Uh, last week, so these numbers might be already a little bit behind. Uh, I will say you can see here 2.159 billion occurrence records. Or two, yeah, 2.159 billion. OK, when I did this same presentation last spring, this was only at like 1.4 billion. Um, so it increased by like 50% in a year, which is fantastic. But what's really important here is you've got many, many data sets. You have a lot of publishing institutions using this information and over here over 7,000 peer reviewed papers using that data. That means if you post a picture of a squirrel, it could end up as a data point in somebody's information. Obviously, they're probably not going to reference every observation, but they might be 
ref, uh, referencing that population or the, the dynamics of the group as a whole. Um, and part of that information is what's come from your observations. Uh, could be timing, it could be um, uh, some characteristic of the organism that you posted. So it's really neat to think that, you know, out of all these papers, um, I've, I've, I've put quite a few things on iNaturalist, and I always like to think that somewhere in a few of those papers is information that I posted on iNaturalist and someone was able to use. I did actually have one person um, email me about an observation I made, and I had kind of hidden where it was. Uh, and they just wanted to make sure, confirm that the county that it was in, uh, because they were writing a paper on, I think it was um, mayflies? It was some, or was caddisflies? It was one of those. Um, and I had posted an, an image of one that was at a, a, a porch light uh, at my in-laws. Uh, and they just wanted to confirm what county it was in because they were writing up a report and that was one of the species that they were writing their paper about. So it was really neat to see that. I've had people contact me about invasive species I reported. Um, so you'll, you'll have a little bit of, um, you can generate some really interesting connections and uh, questions and dialogue with people just by posting up to iNaturalist. Oops, I think I clicked off. There we go. So, um, and you don't have to take a lot of pictures. I'll tell you, I take a lot of pictures. I, I like, to, obviously I do programs like this, and so I like to have a lot of pictures and, and options available, but I just like to take pictures. I like to take pictures of the plants and the critters I've seen, and I'd like to know what I'm seeing, and it's become so much easier using iNaturalist, which is great. Um, in this case, I happen to be kneeling here, taking a picture of some butterflies, which are Carner blue butterflies, which are, um, on the, I think they're endangered or maybe just threatened, but they're on one of those lists and it, it's, it's, you don't get to see these very often. So it's really neat to see several uh, in one specific spot. But, um, you know, I'm taking pictures of the butterflies. There was this cool bug on the nature center. I went to Huntley Meadows and saw this fascinating turtle. Um, I lived in Colorado for a couple of years, saw really cool things there. Uh, this was growing out of the mulch at um, uh, one of the places I worked. Um, here are some eggs I found in the pond at another nature center where I worked. Whoops. Um, this was also in the pond where I worked. And then I went to Aquaquan and saw this really cool uh, osprey. And so I just want to throw, you know, all these things in. Seeing all these, again, and then taking pictures of it, I have evidence which can become data points. Um, this could be something that a scientist or researcher can use. So how, how do I get that to them? So here's where, where it comes in for you. What is an observation? There are five pieces of information that you're essentially adding every time you put an observation on iNaturalist. Who you are, this is taken care of once you log in. Uh, once you log in, you are the person that's reporting those observations. So they do make a point of asking you to only post your own personal observations. Don't throw up a picture of a whale that someone else saw on their trip to Maine. Only post stuff that, that you've seen. Um, and then what you saw, this is um, the name of the organi organism. So the name of the plant, the name of the butterfly, the name of the snake, uh, the name of the fungus, whatever it is. Um, and if you're not sure, just take a guess. I always tell people, don't leave it blank. Don't just leave it to unknown um, because you have a lot of people that spend time on iNaturalist identifying and, and sorting through things. And sometimes they're looking for very specific groups. So they're only looking for um, butterflies. They're only looking to look at dragonflies. They only want to look at birds. If you get it to bird or butterfly, obviously this is a butterfly. It's not a snail. Uh, it's not an elephant and it's not a plant. So you could at least get it to butterflies. And then somebody who's interested in butterflies is more likely to see that because it's already classified at least that far down. So if at all that you can help it, don't ever leave anything unknown because you're going to get more answers and more uh, hits on your observation when you at least get it that far down. Um, when you saw it, um, just about any device that you're going to be using to take pictures probably records this for you from our smartphones to our digital cameras. So ideally, you don't need to enter this, although if you have an older camera, it might still need to. Uh, where you saw it, again, the same thing. If you enable your, if you have GPS on your camera or your phone, uh, you can enable that. Um, I have mine enabled, so I don't have to do that anymore because it used to be like scan, scan, scan all the way down from space to the, the region and then find the park and then find the area in the park. Um, and so I use this because it just it does save some time, although I feel like I got really good at finding places where I went from outer space. 
Um, and then the evidence of what you saw, and again, this is obviously the photo or the sound recording that you're going to use. So let's look at one. Um, I think we probably all know what this is, but uh, this was a nice simple one to take a picture of. Here's an Eastern gray squirrel sitting on the, uh, the fence at our pond. Uh, so I went into my profile and I clicked on upload up there in the upper right corner, and this is everywhere, any, anywhere you are in iNaturalist. If you're doing this from the desktop and you're uploading photos from your uh, digital camera, um, this is the easiest way to, this is the easiest way to do it. And this is everywhere on every screen. You'll be able to find that upload button. So I click upload. I have the option, option to choose files and there's some other import options. I always just choose files. I go into where my pictures are. I choose the ones I want to choose. Um, and then you usually get a big screen. This is only showing one, but you might get, you know, your laptop or, or desktop can be a pretty big screen and it can usually show multiple of these at one time. Whichever one is highlighted is the one you're interacting with. Um, and now that I've got my my record set, I'm going to start filling in that information. Again, you're already logged in, so you don't have to do that every time. If you have metadata with your camera or your phone, it will automatically populate the date and the location if you have the location also set up. You really just have to click on that species name and decide what it is. There are so many observations now in iNaturalist. Um, and I always I say this and I always forget and I can't remember if it's an algorithm or if it's a if it's like an AI or if it's a little bit of both, but they have this really amazing feature where you click on this and it will analyze your picture and um, give you what it thinks it could be. Uh, and a lot of times it gives you the genus. So it doesn't get you the species, but it gets you the genus. Um, so you could have an idea if it's it knows what it's talking about just by seeing the genus. Yes, it's definitely a tree squirrel. I know it's an Eastern gray squirrel. It just happens to be the first one up here, which is great because um, it means that that's working really good, at least for this species. Sometimes if you don't have a bunch of that species, you might not get a good hit. Don't be afraid to come down the list if it's something else here and the computer's not seeing it right, or to just type in your own, the species name yourself if you think it's something different, okay? Um, I want to make sure if you're using iNaturalist, don't be afraid not intentionally necessarily, but don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to say, you know what, All right, I'm just going to go with, I can go with genus or I can say, I really, really, from everything I looked at, I thought it was a fox squirrel, okay? When people check this, they will um, let you know if they think it's incorrect. They will add identifications that, that um, they think are correct. Um, I've never seen anyone do it meanly. I think it's a, a really helpful. It's been a really helpful community. Uh, a lot of people that want to help out, that want to share their information, um, that want to see what other people are seeing. I just I feel like it's it's a pretty good place online compared to many, many others. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to to learn something new, to to take a chance or, you know, even to make identifications on other uh, people's information. And, and sometimes you get them wrong. It just happens. I've gotten tons of them wrong. Um, but it's always exciting to get the right information so I know that I don't, I won't be making that mistake again and I know what I'm talking about, which is always really good. Um, so here we go. Eastern Gray Squirrel. I entered in what it was. It was already populated with the metadata from the photo when, and then um, I know this is from my camera, so I know I had to actually scan through the map myself to get to the, whoops, to get to the where. Um, a note on the on the where because this can be important for some people. You can change that location from public to obscured to private. Um, if you can help it, you know, if you don't need to use private, please don't. Um, because that just means somewhere in the world and that can make the identification tougher for people. If you do obscured, it's still going to have it in the correct region and that can probably make the difference for getting that identification. Uh, if you really have a question, if you really, really know what it is, you can put the location as private um, and you might get a message from somebody saying, hey, I can't tell you what this is because, you know, you didn't tell me where it is and that's fine. Um, I've had that on a few as well where uh, especially specifically um, it was a, a family of, of nesting eastern screech owls and I just didn't want people to know initially when I put it up where that was because they didn't want them to get disturbed. I didn't even want them to get disturbed the following year if they came back in the same area. Um, some species are automatically obscured by a naturalist, which I think is great. I think Eastern box turtle is, is an example of one that's just, um, you know, they want people finding these and then, you know, going and picking them up. Um, and so uh, if it's if any of this is a resource that you're concerned about, just don't. Um, 
oh, what was I going to say? Just don't, um, you know, leave it public. Uh, you know, feel free to do that. Um, a lot of the things that I obscure are because they're on private land. It's either, you know, where I live or it's where uh, my family might live. And so I want to make sure that that doesn't show up. Um, if we have time at the end, I can jump out of here uh, and show you how that'll show up on iNaturalist when you look at that um, as well. Right. Uh, and then if you have to, like I said, most of the projects now, they do it on their own, but you can still add your observation to a project as well. You can scan through the ones that you've joined. Um, you can't add it to a program project you haven't joined. Um, so you need to join a project if you want to be uh, adding observations to it. Um, but yeah, and here, so Virginia Biodiversity Project, which I said since I have since stopped adding to because now, now there's another one that's Virginia Biodiversity. Uh, or I think it says bio blitz and it's just everything that's been reported in Virginia. So I don't need to really do this because I think the other one does the work for me, so I don't have to make that extra effort. Uh, and then here we go. And then you can go to your observation table and here first line Eastern Gray Squirrel is my observation. Um, actually, you know, I mentioned obscured this odd square almost cloud of observations. These are all observations within and around my home uh, and they're all obscured around here so it's not entirely obvious where that is um, and that's what it looks like but again I can show you a uh, more example of that at the end if anybody's interested and then here we go eastern gray squirrel here's my um you know my posted thing now since then I have it's gotten a research grade obviously it's it's um a decent enough picture picture that you can tell what it is and i've had people agree with me on it but at the time i took this screen grab was right after i posted it so this is you know needs id is is what it's going to say initially until you get that first um agreement on an observation uh but since then it's been in it's into four projects actually these are all autom the first three are automatic so it would have been in those first three right away and then obviously i added it to this virginia biodiversity project as well so when you're on your phone I, what I love about the phone app is I find myself taking more and more photos with my phone. And what I love about the phone app is I can um, at any time, like if I'm in line, I always, like, I always use the DMV example. If I'm in line at the DMV, I just pull out my phone and sort through my pictures and start adding stuff to iNaturalist while I'm waiting. Because um, if I'm out in the field, I'm not going to be like, oh, look, a frog. And I take a picture of the frog and then I upload the frog. Um, and I think sometimes, especially for like certain bio blitz events, they'd like you to do that because it's a real time accumulation of everything, which is kind of nice. Um, but if I'm out in the field, I want to be snapping pictures and getting my evidence of everything that's around me. You know, I don't want to miss anything. I can add that all in later, which is typically what I do. Um, so this is for the iPhone. This is what the iPhone interface looks like. Uh, I open iNaturalist and I'm on the me page. And what I'm going to do is go to observe. So I'll touch observe. And this is what pops up. This is a little bar at the bottom. Um, and I can do one with no photo, which I mentioned, like I said, it's casual and nobody can back you up or identify it. So it'll never be research grade, but you can certainly do that <clears throat> if you want to make a note to something that you saw. <clears throat> I can go to the camera and take a picture live of, of something with uh, through the iNaturalist app, <clears throat> or I can go to my photo library and look at pictures I've already taken to add those in. Um, if you saw me sitting here at the beginning of the program while we were waiting for everybody to get here, that's what I was doing was kind of going through some of my pictures from, uh, I think, late last week still. I don't think I've caught up this week yet. Uh, or you can record sound, and this is something new. Uh, within the last year or two, they added, which is fantastic because before you had to record the sound and then upload it to SoundCloud and then import it from SoundCloud into iNaturalist, which is a little bit of a pain. And now you can just record it right on your phone. Uh, I will say, like, I have an iPhone, so I always turn the iPhone around so that the part that I talk into is pointed away from me at whatever I'm trying to record a sound of, uh, and that works quite nicely. Uh, there are nice graphics on the um, what you call it uh, on the iNatural site for there's nice information for how to make an observation with your iPhone and with your Android. Uh, and so if you have one of those, I certainly recommend looking at those. Um, I will be doing a program in person on Saturday, April 30th, so a week from Saturday uh, at Gulf Branch. Uh, that you can sign up for and we'll be doing these doing some observations in person for the city nature challenge um certainly feel free to email me anytime you should have my email from the confirmation emails i sent out um 
you know, and you can check in with me if that one's full on Saturday. Might still have room for a few more if you want to just have a little practice to do that um, before that starts. So let's talk about your photos. Um, I had somebody once share a really nice handout with me that I don't have right now um, about how to take photos for iNaturalist. And I think their first piece of information which was the best, which is take the photo you want first. Then worry about the photo for iNaturalist later. You know, get the photo you, you want that shows what you want, the pose, the behavior, the color, the structures, whatever it is. Get that first. Then worry about getting a photo that can be identified on iNaturalist. Now, um, this is what I'm particularly proud of because I think I spent 20 minutes single stepping my way through a marsh in order to get this this image of this dragonfly that for whatever reason sat still longer than I expected it to. Um, this is a 12 spotted skimmer from uh, Massachusetts. You can actually find these in. I've seen this in uh, blue line, uh, which is really, really neat. Uh, it's a very, very pretty dragonfly. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud of this picture. I, I think it came out pretty well. Um, this is what I'm always hoping for with my pictures, um, but I want to warn you. Um, there is a lot of critters out there that no matter how good your photo. You still can't get to species. Uh, on the left is a moth. There are in the uh, there's um, the Peterson guides to moths of the northeast and southeast are really nice, and I think they give you information on how to identify between the two species. That's in the this is the genus is Xanthotype. I don't know if I'm saying it right. X A N T H O T Y P E. Um, and and in those guides, it'll tell you the difference. What I've read online several places is you essentially have to dissect. Um, their adult bits in order to actually figure out what kind of moth this is. You know, it's pretty. Just want to take a picture of it because it's sitting on the wall of the nature center I was working at. I don't need to dissect it to get down to species. I'm I can be happy with genus. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that sometimes, no matter you know how good your picture is, or maybe you didn't take enough angles or get enough different angles, you may not get to genus. And and I want you to be okay with that because you can still find out and learn it and see neat things by that. Um, even if you can't get to a, a specific um. Uh, specific species and sometimes especially with insects you won't get to a common name you're just going to get a latin name anyway so be ready for that as well and the bird on the right hopefully most of you are like what's well, a crow of course that you know it's a crow that one's real easy um not everyone realizes we have american crow and fish crow in the region uh, and there's enough of a significant overlap in their sizes uh that despite what some birders have told me it's relatively difficult uh, if not impossible, just to identify them by eye. So the best way to identify them is by call. And um, American crows are ah, 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 and fish crows go eh, eh. So uh, it's a very nasally call. And so um, if you have that information, you can include it like in the description when you write it in and say, I heard the call, I didn't record it. Or, you know, if we record the call, then you, you get there automatically. But just a picture like this really shouldn't be able to tell you fish crow or American crow. I've had some people on iNaturalist like, oh, it's definitely fish crow. And I'm like, you don't, you, you can't tell without a call. If I didn't put the information for the call in, it's, it's just the genus is Corvus and that's where it's going to be. Um, sometimes you don't get the, exactly the picture you want or you can't get close enough to that bird. There's still enough here to do an identification. I could have put the picture in. I think what I actually did was I cropped it uh, and put a circle around it. So the circle certainly helps because now here, it could have been the tree. It could have been the bird. Maybe I didn't even see the bird when I took a picture of the leaves of the tree. Uh, but what I want is the bird. So you can circle it and you can also crop it and make it bigger. Once you have this image, you can see the orange bars on the wings. You can see the blue and the dark on the wings. You can see the really thick bill. And, and this is a blue gross beak. Um, and so even though it's not, you know, this is never going to grace the cover of National Geographic, it's a picture that has enough information that you can get an identification out of it. Um, and, it, and sometimes no matter how far away it is, you know what it is. Look at that tail. It's a red tail on a hawk. It's a red tailed hawk. Um, I feel like in, in I always tell people in um, hindsight, I wish I'd still crop this um, just to because it's a lot of blue space and that doesn't need to be there. Um, but I was still able to, you know, post it and two, you can see two photos of all both from the same distance. Um, but I got research grade. With both of these. Um, uh, with, with these images, so I still got where I wanted to be uh, and it still got added to some projects. Uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, Gulf Branch. And birds of the world, um, so that's really, really neat. And so again, hopefully. 
this information is helping someone. And I got the research grade and ended up at the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Your pictures can be really not good, but they can be good enough to show the field marks you need to get an identification. I don't know that. I think actually I might have even been able to get away with just this one photo, um, but these three photos together I was able to get an identification. You see the spotted breast, the uh, dark line through the eye. You can see the coloration on the wings here. You can see kind of the two-tone bill. There's lightish pink in the middle and it's got a dark tip here. Um, and it's definitely shapes and looks like a, uh, looks like a shorebird, a spotted sandpiper. And so, you know, there's, you know, none of those are really, really great pictures. I was able to get uh, an identification, uh, get it to research grade, and it ended up in a couple projects, Birds of the World and then Limestone Park uh, in uh, Alabama. So that's really, really, really neat. And again, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if how much or if any of my stuff gets used, but I hope that I'm contributing to some bigger snapshot. Um, when it comes to plants, it can be really helpful to get more than one part. You know, getting a picture of the flower may not be enough, but if you can get a picture of the flower, get a picture of the arrangement of the leaves, the shape of the leaves, even the venation, how these veins show up, uh, how big this plant might be, that can make the difference too. Again, common milkweed is kind of an easy one, but even though um, I thought it was pretty easy to identify just from the photo of the flower, I included both of these photos to make sure I got a good ID. Uh, in this case, I was able to angle myself so that you could see the bark in behind the, the leaves of the tree. Uh, and that was another one where I only needed one photo because I got the, the pieces I needed there as well. Uh, sometimes if you've got a tree, especially if you're like in a field, if you can get a picture of the entire tree, you know, and get that shape, that could be uh, help be diagnostic as well. Um, but, you know, if you can get pictures of the leaves and picture of the bark, uh, that's usually really, really helpful. Uh, mushrooms are the same deal, okay? Um, not just a picture of the mushroom. But a picture of the side, the structure of the stalk, and even a picture of the gills underneath can be really, really helpful. Even with all three pictures, didn't get past genus, but Amanita is still pretty cool. Uh, and if you know anything about mushrooms, Amanita is a pretty big deal. It's definitely one you don't want to, certainly don't want to eat and might not even want to touch. So I still need to find an, an, an one of the Amanitas in the park, even if I don't know which one it actually is. If you include a photo, I always recommend if you can, crop it. Um, I like to use bug guide. I actually cut my teeth. My first um, community science website I used a lot of and posted a lot too was actually bug guide. Um, and I remember getting a couple of kind of pointed emails being like, you really need to cut, you know, um, close in on the bug. And that's what they want. Um, and they weren't always nice. So I feel like there's a much nicer tone on there now than there was when I started doing it. Um, you know, you really want to make sure that people know what is the subject of your photo. So we've got three American white pelicans here. We've got two kinds of turns and then off to the left is this gull. Um, but the, the person who posted this, and it's the only reason I did it because I don't, don't want to shame anybody, uh, but the person who posted this in their de description wrote, wrote left foreground. And that is this laughing gull right here. And so now you know which um, which bird in this picture of six birds, which one or, you know, or ones, uh, in this case is one, is the subject of the, um, of your identification of what you want to see. OK, so um, I really uh, appreciate to do that. I can't tell you how many times I'll see a picture. Um, and remember, I, I think I said earlier, you know, don't just do unknown. Try to get it. If you can't get the species, at least try to get the right group where I'll see a picture and it says unknown and it's just a jumble of plants and there, there might be more than ones. Which plant do you want or a jumble of birds? And which bird do you want? So always try to make it easy for whoever the identifier is that's looking at your observation to understand what part of that picture or what um, object in that picture is what you want identified. Um, and I don't think I have an example, but you know, you can also put in pictures of, of scat. You could put in pictures of um, uh, what you call it, um, footprints, uh, feathers. Uh, you know, pieces and parts that'll still get you stuff as well um, or still get you identifications as well. So that can be a, a, another good use of this. Um, so here is a picture of a bunch of birds and. You know, I knew I couldn't post this up there because the bird I wanted is actually if you can see my cursor, it's this little guy right here to the right of the raft, you know, near the right side of the raft. And so I included this picture, but my main picture was actually the picture all cropped all the way down to just show this guy. But you can see the yellow in the eye and you can see the tone of the bill. And this is a common golden eye. Uh, and I was still able to get the identification out of it. 
Um, but I, I definitely had to crop down that picture in order for people to see what it was. I could have put a circle uh, or an arrow there, but by cropping it, I was able to save it larger so you could see a little more of the detail. Again, not a not a great or even perfect picture, but enough to show the characteristics that um, someone would need to make that identification call. Um, so this is another photo I did use. Uh, there are like these two up here in the upper right are buffalo heads. There's one right here. Again, ho I'm hoping you see my cursor, but I was really trying to spotlight in this picture where these um, cousins of the Canada Goose here, the Brants, and then the Scop as well. So I cropped the picture. Uh, and then I made a copy of each picture with some circles to show which ones I wanted. So for one observation, I put this picture in with these two red circles and again the main picture, but I was indicating that these are the birds I want to identify. And then for another observation, I put this picture in with a circle around the scop, but also still included this crop diversion as well. So people knew, you know, had a couple different ways to look at, but I could also see exactly what I wanted um, as far as what I was identifying. Um, I think my next slide is sound. And I don't think any of you can hear it because I don't know if I shared my sound. I let it play through the second call just in case you did. But again, you can record sound. And if you don't know, um, at least if you know it's a bird or it's a frog or it sounds like a cricket, you know, give that a whirl and at least get that up there. I had an idea. Um, I or actually didn't know what this was, so I put birds. This was I was out in California in at the um, beginning of December last year a couple of months ago and so I knew it was a bird I didn't know and I'd never seen so I was able to get a recording posted up uh, and then people told me later Buick's one which turns out it was one I had seen I just my first one had been like a, a day earlier um, but I didn't know their call at all so it was really neat to get that call on here and now you know I have that call that I can always look at, come back to if I ever am curious um, and so I have a, a, a modest uh, grouping of um, calls but I really enjoy um, the audio ones I put up there because it, it's fun. It's just a little different from taking photos. Um, so again, you'll have a profile on there. You can have your name up on there and a username. You can be as cryptic as you want with that if you, if you do or don't want to. Do, if you know other people will find you, you have the opportunity to put a little um, uh, description of who you are here and you know what your interests are. And you know some people put a lot. Some people put a little. Some people don't put anything. It just says Ken Rosenthal is a naturalist! Exclamation mark. Um, you can follow people to see what they're seeing, you know, whether they're friends, colleagues, coworkers, people that do stuff in other areas. Um, you can also people and obviously then people can follow you. So you have a list of who's following you and and who you're following. You can create a list at the bottom of favorites um, to show your interests. So, you know, they, they have these some of these different ideas here for having your profile, and making it, um, you know, a little more social. Um, media ask uh, and doing that they have some chat some chats to discuss different topics. Um, but again, the, you know, the main thing I do is I love putting my my stuff up there to to get identification and, and to hopefully again contribute to a bigger picture. Um, we have several projects around the county. This is our the project for Gulf Branch uh, in Glebe Road Park. Um, but there are 10, yeah, 10 around the county. Barcraft, Barcraft, Barcroft, Bluemont, Donaldson Run, Fort C.F. Smith, I mentioned Gulf Branch, uh, Long Branch and Glen Carlin, uh, Potomac Overlook, Powden Springs, uh, Tuckahoe Park and Windy Run. So these are all um, different ones you can check out. And then, of course, you can always just go on and explore and be like, you know, type in Arlington and just see what's being reported there. Um, one of the reasons that I'm doing this project is because the end of the month is the City Nature Challenge. Um, it started several years ago as a, just a you know, kind of a friendly challenge between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, the following year it bloomed into 40 or 60 cities. Um, and this past year, I forget how many cities they had, 200 some maybe, um, just a lot. But you can see 1.2 uh, million observations of 47,000, almost 48,000 species by 55,000 observers around the world. It's really, again, I, I like this idea of, of the number of people that can um, participate um, in doing essentially the same thing over four days. And you're part of this global group of over 55,000 people doing this. It's just really, 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 really cool to see so many people doing that. And then of course, um, each metropolitan area has their own 
uh, project as well. So this is the um, the DC metro area. We have over 43,000 observations made by 2,000, you know, over 2,000 observers. So that was really cool as well. Nearly 3,000 species observed. Um, our our metropolitan area, according to this city nature challenge, pretty big. You know, we got a county in uh, West Virginia. We got a you know a few in Maryland. Obviously, we can't encroach on Baltimore. They have their own. A metropolitan area, but you can see we go down into um, uh, Maryland over here as well, uh, all the way down past Fredericksburg, out to Culpeper, you know, nearly out into Winchester. So we do get some black bear uh, sightings, among other really neat stuff in there. So there's a lot of area you can travel and still be contributing to our metropolitan area. Uh, so this year it is April 29th through May 2nd, uh, and then from May 3rd through 5th, Seventh, I don't remember um, the ed day, but I know I think the second is um, uh, Monday. May second is Monday, April 29th is a Friday, so it's Friday through Monday, and then Tuesday through Thursday, they try to get as much identified as they can if it, what hasn't been identified yet. Uh, and then Friday, they tend to make a, an announcement of you know the final numbers for everything, and they keep changing because more keep pouring in and identifications. And as identifications come in, it can change the number of species um, that are being seen there. Uh, you can join it. You don't have to. Every observation taken in all these different metropolitan areas around the world um, over these four days is going to be included, whether you're aware of it or not. And so, um, but certainly there are a lot of people that will be out there trying to make observations for this. So um, there will be a lot of uh, of things popping up on here, which is which is fantastic. Uh, and then, of course, here's ours. I copied this this morning uh so it's less than 12 hours at this point it's probably uh eight days and what time is this? It's eight it's probably down to about four hours and so many minutes um and again you can you can join or not you'll get updates if you're interested um but it's really neat to see how many people get out and do this here is the uh, the map of where we expect to get observations from you can see north and south america are well represented a uh, pretty good patch in europe uh southern africa there's a lot going on there and there's some uh throughout asia and even down into australia new zealand i i have to say one year they did um someone from antarctica made some observations and it was so cool to see what they posted and went out and, and you know showed for those couple of days they were able to find a little bit of free time and and take some uh, make some observations um so if nothing else you know if you do this and, and you put a few things up check out what's showing up from all these other areas around the world because there's some really neat stuff you know things that you're obviously not going to see in virginia so it's kind of neat to see what other people are uh, finding as well and i like looking at some of the other projects um you can see here you know the first two look like they're from italy the next one is um is pennsylvania and the third one i'm not exactly sure where um where that would be and so there's a lot of really neat places and a lot of neat biodiversity and just uh, cool to see what everybody's finding. So if you're going to do this, where should you go? Well, first of all, we've got tons of parks around here. Uh, as I mentioned, I uh, get 10 really cool spots. So we're trying to get information of around uh, Arlington. Uh, we'd love to see the numbers and all these projects go up. Um, you can go to places like Huntley Meadows. Obviously, you can go out to Shenandoah. You know, I showed you that map. That map is is linked to the the project. Um, site as well, so you can find that if you want. Um, but you don't have to go really far. You can go to your neighborhood park. You can take observations in your house, uh, and I think this is this is fantastic. Again, I mentioned this project earlier. Um, you can find you know mice and pigeons, pigeons at uh, Home Depot, uh, cellar spider from and uh, house centipede, uh, camel cricket, all from our basement. Here's a garter snake that was hiding in our animal care room once. Um, I just found a four foot rat snake in our nature center. That's another fun one as well. Um, so, you know, you don't have to leave your house to to add observations. And of course, you got spiders and the other stuff that might come in as well. Um, you can find very tiny plants all around your lawn. You know, a lot of these came from the edges of lawns. You've got um, one of the buttercups here. This is a bird eyed speedwell if i remember correctly this is one of the dead nettles i think this is red dead nettle below its henbit dead nettle i think this is a potentia this is one of the mock strawberries um this looks like creeping charlie or ground ivy uh and this is one of the dandelions and take good pictures of dandelions because there's more than one they all look 
they all might look the same, but you want to get the leaf shapes in on your dandelions and you'll see some different. You might find that you have a, a different kind of dandelion you're expecting. There's common dandelion, but we also get this one here has, I think, really triangular leaves um, in, in the shape. And this is actually a red seeded dandelion, which is kind of neat. It's something I stumbled on a couple uh, years ago. So I love this quote from Albert Einstein. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. Um, I want to show you real quick. It's not iNaturalist and it's not the City Nature Challenge, but I want to make a mention of eBird. Um, I do a lot of birding, so I do a lot of posting the eBird as well of my bird sightings. Cornell Lab sponsors this. They have, um, I don't know how long eBird has been around, but my guess is there are a lot of birders that took the time to put all their old bird lists in uh, and so there are probably decades of records in here and they can use this data to make some really neat stuff this is um, a map of black pole warbler abundance throughout the year I'm gonna go ahead and hit play and what you'll see is you'll see the birds are in south america and then you'll watch their migration across the island they go up into northern north america to nest and in september they come back out they go across the atlantic and and over these islands here to the wet to the east and back into south america this is directly generated by data from ebird and you can see here on the thing it's ebird data from 2006 to 2020. um I don't know. I don't know how to say. It. I don't know how it comes across, but I feel so like I, I was involved in something to see this piece of data and know that some of these observations. I started again. Obviously, Northern Virginia. This is the only. I, I never saw black poles before living here, and obviously, I could have been other places. But to see those observations down here and know that I probably contributed a little bit of that relative abundance data there is just it's just fascinating. They have this for so many birds. In fact, one of the things they recently uh, released is this map. Each of these dots is a composite of one species. So it's kind of like the center of the range for these species, but it shows how these species of birds move around uh, on North and South America throughout the year. Uh, so as the, col the colors are changing to show the, the date, the uh, months, which you can see down on the bottom left. Um, but it's showing some that go pretty far and some that don't go. But there's 118 species represented by these dots in this graph. And again, this is generated from all the data that comes in from birders who voluntarily share their uh, bird list and what they see throughout the year. Um, and so it's really cool. And I know I, yeah, I was reading the list and several of these species I have, you know, I've seen some more than others. Um, and so it's just really neat to think that um, not just myself, but anybody that's contributed to eBird has contributed essentially to this graphic, which can then be used to educate people and show people the interconnectedness of birds. Um, just not, you know, in our hemisphere, obviously, but, um, you know, they, they can generate data like this on bird species all around the world. So to me, this is this is the kind of thing that if you're out and you're going to take a few pictures and you can do this as well, it, it's certainly worth doing and it adds to um, our scientific knowledge of the natural world around us. Um, and I, I like to end with this little guy too. This is a striped mud turtle instead of an eastern mud turtle, uh, one of the northernmost records. Um, and again, I just thought I was getting a mud turtle, but somebody looked at the picture closely and see the stripe that runs into the back of the eye and actually runs through the eye. Um, it was really exciting to realize I had found a, a species I hadn't seen before, but it was also kind of, I guess at the time, um, the guy seemed to make it sound like it was a pretty big deal because it was one of the northernmost records for uh, a turtle that's found more in the south. Um, so again, you never know what you're going to find and what you share and um, how important a piece or an interesting a piece it could be for someone else. Um, so that's my presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, I can also pull up iNaturalist if anybody wants to, um, to do that. I'm going to stop sharing though and I'm going to check the chat while we're sitting here. But if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them uh, now. Chat. They include all right. Nine interest username if our photos included in research. Uh, I don't know. That's a really good question. It depends on uh, maybe how important that picture is. Um, sometimes I have a feeling that um, you know I'm talking about data points, but it's just like there were this many of this bird seen in this region throughout the year. Um, you know I don't know exactly what shows up, but um, certainly if somebody is browsing iNaturalist and looking for something, they could ask you for that. Um, I've had 
at least one. I've had a couple of pictures, one off Bug Guide and one off iNaturalist used in publications people requested, probably because I'm not a, you know, a regular photographer. And they're like, hey, I bet you this guy will give it to us for free, which I did. I just got my name in a magazine, so that was pretty neat. And they did, you know, ask how I wanted the, that information shown. Another question. Uh, anyone else have any questions? I do, Ken. I, sure. Um, I couldn't <laughs> type fast enough. Um, so, do you always upload your photos on your computer and fill in all this, or are you able to do it from your phone? Because I haven't been able to figure that out. Maybe I need to go through the tutorial. Uh, so, I used to do it all on the computer. Um, and then I started, as I took more and more photos of the on my phone, I got to the point where it's like, this is a real pain to have to take stuff off my phone to then just upload it when I can just upload it on my phone through the app. And so I began to do that more. Again, I'm motivated by numbers and I'm motivated by lists. I'm surprised I'm not more of a baseball fan. And so when I go out, I'm just snapping pictures. I don't want to miss anything. I want to take as many pictures as I can, experience as much as I can. I can do that later when it's dark, unless I'm also doing something after dark as well. Um, and so, you know, I just bring everything back to the the um, to the house or where, you know wherever it was, and I do it online. And so I, I always do my photos from my camera on the desktop because that's just the easiest way to do it. Um, but I did switch to doing any images or any sound recordings I take from my phone to doing it all through the app on my phone. Uh, and I love the app on my phone. I use it all the time now. Like I said, that's what I was tic-tacking away with as we were running up towards 7 o'clock. Um, but the only thing that I don't like about the app is you can't go back and look at other people's stuff and browse like you can on the desktop. So one of the other advantages of using the, the desktop, the iNaturals.org um, desktop interface is you can explore and see what other people are seeing. Um, and you know, see what you can add identifications to as well. And again, I get a lot of, I've gotten several messages from different people asking questions or clarification or, hey, that was an invasive. Did, what did you do after you found it? Uh, in one case, it was like I pulled the plan, uh, but I took a picture to record that it had been there. Um, so yeah, um, but I will pretty much now, if it's on my camera, I do it on the desktop. If it's on my phone, I do it through the phone. Okay, thanks. Sure, sure. Any other questions? All right. Uh, well, I'm going to thank you all for being here. Um, there's five minutes left. If anyone wants to hang around and ask any more questions, please do. Um, otherwise, um, hopefully I'll see you out there recording stuff on iNaturalists, feel free to stop by to email me if you have questions or think of something later. Uh, feel free to stop by the Nature anytime. I love talking about iNaturalists and, and happy to show you or work through an identification or um, work through how to use something on uh, your mobile phone. So please do stop by. Um, I will uh, send everybody out an email again when this is finished with the post so everybody can see it if they'd take another look at it if they'd like to. Um, otherwise, thanks everybody for joining me and I'm going to sign off here in about 10 seconds.